This is Blake with Defending Zion back with another episode um, it's on the Abrahamic test today. This is a, a very important principle that we need to understand as it relates to making our calling and election sure. And before we dive into this, I, I just want to take some time to thank those of you that have listened to my other uh, presentations. Um, I've put a lot of work into it with the hope that um, I may be able to touch somebody's heart and that s something that I say may be able to, to help you in your life. And so I sincerely hope and pray that that's been the case. So let's get started. What was the Abrahamic test? Well, before we understand why the Lord uses Abraham's test as a model for the test that each of us will have to pass through, we first need to examine Abraham and his life to get a basic structure and a basic understanding. And I would encourage you to actually go through and create this kind of a chronology. I've done kind of a basic one here of Abraham's life. Um, there's you know information both in Genesis and in the book of Abraham about his life. And it's, you know, as you study both of them, you kind of understand where these different events fit into place. And by doing that, it gives you a better understanding of why Abraham sought for some of the blessings that he did at the specific times that he did. So, without further ado, let's start out with Abraham's life. Uh, we know that Abraham's father was an apostate that had started worshiping heathen gods. Um, we also know that in the land where they lived, child sacrifice was an essential part of worshiping the heathen gods, as well as virgin sacrifice, so sacrificing virgins. And we know that Abram, or Abraham, as he's later known, uh, witnessed firsthand the sacrifice of three virgins because they refused to bow down and worship the heathen gods. And Abram himself even, um, you know, was taken violently and, uh, you know, the false priests attempted to sacrifice him in a similar manner. And as you'll remember the story, just as um, he's about ready to be sacrificed, the angel of the presence of the Lord unlooses his bands and he's able to escape and to not be sacrificed. After this, Abram hears the voice of Jehovah promise him that he will eventually be led out of the land of Chaldea. This is the land where he was living at the time. Uh, Jehovah also promises Abram that he will obtain the priesthood and that his name will be known in the earth forever. And sometime during this time as well, he marries uh, Sarai and um, begins a new life with her. And then, finally, Abram gets the commandment to leave the land of Chaldea. And he leaves Chaldea and go, he goes to Haran. And uh, in Haran, as he's there for a while, Jehovah then commands him to depart Haran. And he's given a promise as he departs that he will be a minister for the Lord in a strange land. And he also alludes to Abram having seed or children that will bear the priesthood unto all nations. During this time, Abram continues to seek for the blessings of the fathers, which includes the ability to be a father of many nations and a prince of peace. Abraham is also faithful in obeying the command of the Lord to offer sacrifices on altars that he physically builds with his own hands. And we also learn that during Abram's and Sarai's um, marriage, that they're unable to have children themselves. And so he's received a lot of these promises about, you know, um, you know, his seed, and he's seeking to be a father of many nations, but yet he's not seeing those blessings f fulfilled in his own life. And then a famine strikes, and Abram and Sarai move to Egypt. And the Lord instructs Abram to tell the Pharaoh that Sarai is his sister. And Pharaoh covets Sarai because of her beauty. Now, because of this, the Lord sends plagues upon Egypt and Pharaoh, and he does this because of their disobedience to God's commandments. Uh, you got to remember that the 
people that were in Egypt were actually descendants of um, Noah. Um, so they had been taught the gospel and um, they knew what was right and wrong. And so, you know, for this wickedness that was taking place, they were, um, they had these plagues sent upon them. Uh, because of this, Abram flees and he returns to the land of Canaan from Egypt. He rescues his brother-in-law Lot from the evil kings that are in the land. And we learn of um, many wars and many attempts against Abram's life uh, to, to kill him. It's during this time as well that Abram meets Melchizedek, who is the king of Salem. And we know that Melchizedek, um, or Shem, is the son of Noah. And he actually ordains Abram to the priesthood. And you can read about that in Joseph Smith's translation of Genesis 14. After receiving the priesthood, Abram faithfully lives the law of consecration. And he is blessed with great riches as well as great flocks. Abram, and I'm sure Sarai, continue to pray to the Lord for a child. And that the blessings may be fulfilled to them. And it's at this time that Abram is given the vision that uh, is in um, Abraham 3, um, and as well as the rest of the chapters of Abraham. Uh, it's a vision of the stars, the planets, the intelligences, and the premortal realm. And he's told in this vision by God that he was a chosen, um, noble, and great one before he was born. So he learns about his... Um, pre-earth life and what his foreordained mission was here on this earth. Uh, during this time, Abram is given Hagar, his handmaid, and God in, invites Abram to live the law of plural marriage. Abram and Hagar conceive and bear Ishmael. Um, it's at this time that Sarai um, becomes jealous, and so Hagar and Ishmael flee. And later on, we learn that they are late, you know, reunited uh, with Abram and his family. It's at this time that the Lord covenants with Abram that he will be a father of many nations. And his name is changed to Abraham. So this is where, where Abraham actually receives the promise, the, uh, the conditional promise that he will be a father of many nations. And as with any covenant a relationship there's often a, a change of name so here we have Abram to Abraham later we'll have Jacob changed his name to Israel as he covenants with God as part of this promise um, Abraham and Sarah are given a promise that they will bear a son and they're told the son's name is going to be Isaac and Abraham is promised that Isaac will be the rightful heir of the covenant so even though Abraham has Ishmael already uh, he learns that Isaac is to be the heir of the covenant. And to confirm this uh, blessing that Abraham and Sarah to receive, they are visited by three angels. And they are promised that Isaac will be born to them. Sarah gives birth to Isaac. And then Abraham is given a commandment by God to take Isaac and to offer him as a burnt offering on Mount Moriah. Abraham and Isaac um, both are willing to obey God's command, and Abraham goes as far as lifting up his knife to slay Isaac. When at that moment the angel of the Lord commands him to not slay his son, and the angel tells him that he knows that Abraham fears God. So that is Abraham's life in a nutshell. Um, as we look at his life, we can see that Abraham had a lot of different tests. Um, a lot of these tests are similar tests that we experience in our life. Uh, he had an apostate father. He was abused by his father as well as uh, wicked priests. Uh, he had to deal with famine and he had to deal with multiple relocations of his family. Uh, he had to live in foreign lands that he never lived before. Him and his wife experienced infertility. Uh, he experienced a jealous wife. He experienced other men coveting his wife. Uh, he had people that sought to kill him and to take his things. And he was um, asked to live two uh, very important, um, but also very difficult laws, the law of consecration and 
the law of plural marriage. So Abraham did not have an easy life. Um, and we can kind of see that. But of all these tests, uh, none of them really compares to the, the one great test that he faced in his life. And that was the, the test to obey the commandment to slay Isaac. Uh, Isaac was his covenant and promised son. He was the son that um, Abraham was to receive the covenant promised blessings through. Now, why do I say that this is the greatest test? And why did the Lord say this is the greatest test? Well, I think that one reason may have been that because he was involved in doing the same thing that his father had attempted to do to him. So he was asked to slay his son just like he himself had been um, you know, put up uh, for sacrifice by his father. So he, he knew perfectly well how Isaac felt. Um, he had experienced that same trial. And while God had very mercifully saved him from being sacrificed, he was now being asked to sacrifice his son without any real certainty that there would be any last-minute divine intervention. And John Taylor said this about Abraham's test. Um, the prophet Joseph Smith said that if God had known any other way whereby he could have touched Abraham's feelings more acutely and more keenly, he would have done so. It was not only his parental feelings that were touched. There was something else besides. He had the promise that in him and in his seed, all the nations of the earth should be blessed, that his seed should be multiplied as the stars of the heaven and as the sand upon the seashore. He had looked forward through the vista of future ages and seen, by the spirit of revelation, myriads of his people rise up, through whom God would convey intelligence, light, and salvation to a world. But in being called upon to sacrifice his son, it seemed as though all his prospects pertaining to posterity were to come to naught. But he had faith in God, and he fulfilled the thing that was required of him. Yet we cannot conceive of anything that could be more trying and more perplexing than the position in which he was placed. So John Taylor here seems to suggest that this, you know, was the most difficult test for Abraham. It was something that was so narrowly tailored to his situation, um, something that was to try him to the uttermost, um, that there was nothing else that could try him more. And that was exactly what the Lord intended for Abraham. And it's exactly what the Lord intends for all of us. We know, um, as, and we learn through Abraham, that this life is a time of proving. Um, as he's given the vision of the premortal life, he sees where the Savior uh, gets together with those that follow him, and he talks about the purpose of this life. He says, We will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. So proving or testing is absolutely necessary in this life, and it's the purpose of our life. We also learn in this 101st section of the Doctrine and Covenants that um, therefore they must needs be chastened and tried, even as Abraham, who was commanded to offer up his only son. For all those who will not endure chastening, but deny me, cannot be sanctified. So part of this proving means that we are chastened and we are tried. There's two separate parts to this. The first part, chastening. Uh, to chasten is to correct in order to ensure obedience. And then once a person is chastened, they are tried. Uh, to be tried means to be sanctified through testing or trial. This is something that tests our patience and it tests our faith. And in the Book of Mormon, it's referred to as the trial of your faith. And we can actually see this pattern of chastening and trying really well in the parable of the rich young man, which is in Matthew 19. And in that parable, uh, we see a young man who comes to the Savior asking how he personally can obtain eternal life. And Jesus responds by asking whether this young man has been obedient to the commandments. Um, and that's the chastening part. You know, has have his experiences in his life chastened him to the point where he is 
you know, developed a complete obedience to the Lord. And the young man can honestly and truthfully say, yes, uh, he has kept all the commandments from his youth. And the Lord discerning the heart of this young man looks into him and beholds him and loves him. And he says that he still lacks one thing. And then he gives the young man a commandment to sell all that he has and to give it to the poor and then to follow him as a disciple. This is the trying part. This was a rich young man. His possessions were the greatest thing that he had in his life. While he had been completely obedient all of his life, the Lord asked the most difficult thing for him, and that was to give up all his riches. And we learn that this young man went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. So we see there that, that sorrow comes about because he realizes, you know, he's, he's feeling that that struggle, that inner struggle. He's feeling that great weight of what the Lord requires for him. And unfortunately, this young man doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't keep that commitment, doesn't pass that trial or that test because he was so attached to the things that he possessed. The prophet Joseph Smith said that when the Lord has thoroughly proved him and finds that the man is determined to serve him at all hazards, then the man will find his calling and his election made sure. So this proving that I, I mentioned earlier must be thorough. And it's to test whether we are willing to serve God at all hazards or at all times and in all places and all things. Joseph Smith also said that you will have all kinds of trials to pass through. And it is quite as necessary that you be tried as it was for Abraham and other men of God. God will feel after you, and he will take hold of you and wrench your heartstrings. And if you cannot stand it, you will not be fit for an inheritance in the celestial kingdom of God. So this trying is something that's going to, you know, it's going to wrench our heartstrings. It's going to devastate us. It's going to take every every amount of determination that we have and obedience and faith and patience. And it's a it's a trial and it's a test to see if we are fit for an inheritance in the celestial kingdom of God. So in order to be able to obtain great things, we also have to be willing to sacrifice great things. Uh, that's the program of the Lord. Now, what are the parameters of the sacrifice? Uh, we learned this in the Lectures on Faith, Lecture 6, uh, Paragraph 7. It was through this sacrifice, and this only, that God has ordained that men should enjoy eternal life. And it is through the medium of the sacrifice of all earthly things that men do actually know that they are doing the things that are well-pleasing in the sight of God. When a man has offered in sacrifice all that he has for the truth's sake, not even withholding his life, and believing before God that he has been called to make this sacrifice because he seeks to do his will, he does know most assuredly that God does and will accept his sacrifice and offering, and that he has not nor will not seek his face in vain. Under these circumstances, then, he can obtain the faith necessary for him to lay hold on eternal life. So the parameters of this sacrifice are that we are to sacrifice all earthly things. Uh, this can include our own lives, if necessary. And we are to sacrifice all. And we have to also know that God requires the specific sacrifice that we are giving. So we have to know it's his will. We have to be led by the Spirit. We have to have that revelation to know that whatever it is that we are sacrificing is what he requires. Um, we may, you know, try to cheat and, uh, you know, lie to ourselves and say, well, this is really hard, what the Lord requires of us. But it, if, if it is not the hardest thing, then it is not the sacrifice that the Lord requires. Neil A. Maxwell says that the submission of one's will is really the only uniquely personal thing we have to place on God's altar. 
The many other things that we give are actually the things that he has already given or loaned to us. So at its heart, what the Lord is asking of each of us in our own individual lives is to submit our will, to sacrifice that thing that he asks of us. Um, and as you look at that, you know, it is an individual sacrifice. It's a unique sacrifice um, because it's our will. It's something that the Lord has, um, you know, he's bestowed agency upon us, but that choice to be able to give that up is, is truly ours. And it's what the Lord requires. And what is it that we're called to sacrifice for? Brigham Young said that our brethren and sisters who are scattered abroad must be gathered to be tried and then to be blessed with a preparation for a glorious reward. This people will be tried more or less while they remain in the flesh. They may even be called as Abraham of old was to offer up that which is the most dear to them of all earthly objects for the gospel's sake. So we know that this sacrifice is going to further the work of God. It's going to further the work of truth. Um, just as it was for Abraham. Now what is, what is the real purpose of the Abrahamic test? Let's, let's summarize this. Um, the purpose of the Abrahamic test is to thoroughly prove whether a person is willing to obey all of God's commandments and whether they're willing to sacrifice all earthly things. Once a person has passed their Abrahamic test, their calling and election is made sure, and they are given the unconditional promise of eternal life. They will have the blessing of ha having glory added upon their heads forever and ever. And Joseph Smith said that the sacrifice required of Abraham in the offering up of Isaac shows that if a man would attain to the keys of the kingdom of an endless life, he must sacrifice all things. So that's the ultimate purpose of our Abrahamic test, is to make our calling and election sure to obtain an unconditional promise of eternal life, just as Abraham did. We know that another purpose is for us to prepare ourselves to enjoy the presence of the Lord. Brigham Young said that all intelligent beings who are crowned with crowns of glory, immortality, and eternal lives must pass through every ordeal appointed for intelligent beings to pass through in order to gain their glory and exaltation. Every calamity that can come upon mortal beings will be suffered to come upon the few to prepare them to enjoy the presence of the Lord. If we obtain the glory that Abraham obtained, we must do so by the same means that he did. And we must pass through the same experience and gain the knowledge, intelligence, and endowments that will prepare us to enter into the celestial kingdom of our Father and God. How many of the Latter-day Saints will endure all these things and be prepared to enjoy the presence of the Father and the Son? You can answer that question at your leisure. Every trial and experience you have passed through is necessary for your salvation. So, all of these sufferings, including this great suffering, this great test that we experience, is to prepare us to enjoy the presence of the Lord in the celestial kingdom. This Abrahamic test can also help to prepare us for future responsibilities. And Joseph Smith taught this after the Zion's Camp March, in which brethren were asked to go and to, um, you know, basically go and help rescue saints and, and defend the saints uh, that were in Missouri. This is what he told them. Brethren, some of you are angry with me because you did not fight in Missouri. But let me tell you, God did not want you to fight. He could not organize his kingdom with 12 men to open the gospel door to the nations of the earth and with 70 men under their direction to follow in their tracks. Unless he took them from a body of men who had offered their lives and who had made as great a sacrifice as did Abraham. So we know that the, the men and the women and children that were in Zion's camp, none of them actually actually sacrificed their lives, but they did show that they were willing to offer their lives by going. Uh, they knew that it was dangerous um, to go there because of the mobs. 
And all of this was in preparation uh, to prepare them for their responsibilities that they would hold as apostles and as 70. In fact, uh, all the original 12 apostles came from that group as well as the, the first group of 70 that were called in this dispensation. So this Abrahamic test that we experience is also designed to help prepare us for whatever future responsibilities we may have in the kingdom of God. So, we've gone through everything. So let's go through and talk about the principles of the Abrahamic test. What is the, the process or um, how do we go through this? Well, first, I believe everyone will come to a, a point in their life where they are unsatisfied with their current spiritual condition. They'll realize that there are greater blessings to be had. And so the, the person will seek eternal blessings and eternal promises from God. They'll seek eternal life. Once they do this, the person is commanded by the Lord to be obedient in all things, and they will make a covenant with the Lord. After they make this covenant, the person will undergo a period of smaller testings. Uh, this isn't to suggest that they're easy, but they're, they're smaller in comparison to the great test that they will have to go through. So they go through this period of smaller testings to determine whether or not they are willing to be obedient in all things. And this is the chastening part. A lot of people won't even make it through this part. A lot of people will fall away. Uh, they'll uh, be too concerned with the cares of the world, with the things that they've, um, they've obtained or they've acquired, instead of you know, trying to practice true obedience before the Lord. Now, once the chastening does occur for, for an individual, then the Lord will make a conditional promise to them of eternal life. And after this time, or before this time, um, the Lord um, will have given a blessing to this person. Um, perhaps the person will have obtained something or be given something uh, which they treasure and which has truly become priceless to them. So they have this blessing. They have this thing that's that's most important to them. Could be their life. Could be great possessions. Could be a you know a child. What have you? And then the Lord will command the person to sacrifice that blessing. Now in this sacrifice, the person has a sure knowledge that the Lord requires this particular sacrifice, and this is what is known as the trying. This is the, the actual Abrahamic test. This is the test of all tests. And lastly, after the Lord has required this, the person willingly offers to make the sacrifice. They take actual concrete steps to offer the sacrifice. And in doing this, they obtain an unconditional promise of eternal life. And then their calling and their election is made sure. They receive an unconditional promise of eternal life. And that is the process of how an Abrahamic test occurs. The time period that people go through chastening um, is unique. For many people, it can be a short period of time. For others, it can be uh, you know, a whole lifetime that they're chastened. Um, the chastening is to determine whether we're obedient or not. Whether we're, whether we're willing to do what the Lord asks. And so that's up to us. We, we choose how long that takes. And then that great test that we're put to is the trying. That is the ultimate test. Um, like I mentioned earlier, in order to obtain great blessings, there needs to be a great sacrifice. And we need to show the Lord that we're willing to sacrifice the thing that he has asked of us. Brothers and, and sisters, I know that this is a hard doctrine. I know that this is uh, trying, and if we have experienced an Abrahamic test in our life, we have a, a sure testimony of just how difficult that test is. But I also testify that the blessings that we can receive after this test are immense and eternal. And 
I would encourage you to have courage and have faith, no matter where you are in this process, that you trust that the Lord is is allowing these things to happen in your life uh, to refine you, to build you into who he wants you to become and who he knows you have the potential to become. And I want to bear testimony of that and promise you that these things are possible. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.